Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the uh, seminar session on storage. Um, my name is Adrian Cunnington, and I'm going to be uh, uh, your chair for this session. Um, so it's going to be in uh, a couple of parts. I'm going to uh, talk through uh, some slides to start with on uh, managing costs and boosting energy efficiency. Um, and then uh, at the end of my talk, I'm going to say a little bit about uh, CIPC residues monitoring. And then we have a panel discussion on sprout suppression, uh, which will involve uh, three agronomists who are sitting in the front row here, uh, Gary Collins, uh, Richard Baines, and Jeff Beaver. So a um, number of different approaches. We'll try and crack on and use the time to the best of our ability. Um, and uh, so uh, I just need to mention uh, housekeeping. Uh, so uh, there are fire exits, uh, main fire exit at the back of the room. There are alternatives uh, at the side here if we, if we need to use them. Uh, please can you also turn off mobile phones if you haven't already done so. Okay, so uh, we'll get going. Um, so uh, potato storage, uh, one of the big issues we've got at the moment is costs and um, managing costs and uh, getting uh, energy efficiency to uh, cope with the uh, high price of electricity is something that is really taking uh, uh, front of stage at the moment um, for um, potato storage. So I'm going to run through a few uh, points. Some of these things, you, if you've been to one of my talks before, you might have seen previously. Um, other things are a little bit newer. So um, I'm uh, speaking here from, from, from my own perspective. I'm, I'm now run my own business, uh, Potato Storage Insight, um, previously with AHDB for a number of years. Okay, so I'm just going to run through uh, current state of play, uh, talk about some storage basics, uh, electrical metering and recording, uh, air leakage, insulation, making efficient use of air, uh, optimizing uh, refrigeration, which I should have spelt correctly, but didn't, I'm afraid. Um, the importance of automated control and um, just look at uh, a, a strategy going forward, shall we say. Okay, so the state of play for storage at the moment, well, our costs, as I've already mentioned, are escalating uh, significantly. Um, electricity prices have shot through the roof. Um, some unfortunate producers have had up to a fourfold increase. Um, a lot of people have been in a, a slightly better position than that, but it's not, not, not particularly rosy. It's been uh, quite... Uh, uh, daunting, in fact, the, the amount of uh, uh, cost that's having to go towards electricity. Uh, we've got a background of labour costs rising, uh, chemical costs going up as well because we've had changes in the uh, um, things like sprout suppression uh, um, uh, toolbox, shall we say, and that uh, is uh, uh, something else we will be talking about later. Um, and then materials prices, so the actual physical prices of, of materials to build a store um, have escalated from around about 250 pounds a tonne for a new store, heading towards 400 pounds a tonne for new stores now, which is uh, really causing quite a lot of grief to people who want to expand. And uh, all of that's against a background of largely static returns. So if we want to make our stores effective, then um, we have to think about what we're going to do with them. We put our potatoes into the store. We need to be able to ventilate them. We're dealing with living produce. Um, but all of those interventions that we make in that store need to be targeted. So in other words, we need to be switching on um, a fan. Um, we need to be switching on any heat, any cooling, any refrigerant. All of those are things that I call interventions, and we need to be targeting them for a reason. We just don't want to be running the fans for the sake of it. Uh, drying is always key. No, uh, certainly this year has to be prioritized. Um, we cure during pull down as a, as a routine, uh, unless we're very late lifting and, and or cold, and that may apply to some of the, the crops that are coming out of the ground right now. Um, Normally, we vent for around about 15 to 20% of the 
total time for uh, ambient stores and about 40% of the time with a refrigerated store. So it's worth starting to think about those numbers. Does your store fit that model? Does it not? You know, um, you might say, I don't know, in which case we'll come on to some of that in, in a minute. Um, ambient air tends to, uh, to dehydrate more because the humidity is lower uh, than in recirculated air with a refrigeration system. But uh, the water loss is largely proportionate to ventilation time rather than the volume of air. So the longer the fans are on, the more uh, dehydration we're likely to see. And we have to also be careful with things like uh, variable frequency drives, uh, also known as inverters, which are basically speed controls for fans. Um, they can offer very significant savings if we reduce the fan speeds. Um, if we run at 80% uh, of full, um, full speed, then we can uh, pay just half the amount for electricity. Uh, so it's a disproportionate saving, uh, but we mustn't go too low with those settings. Otherwise, if we're too greedy, we upset the balance of the store and the, and the air flows go to pot. So we do need to uh, think about that. What temperature do we need to be running at? Well, it needs to be very much tailored towards variety storage term and whether there's any chemical involved. There's a number of factors there to uh, consider um, in more detail. I'm not going to go through all of those uh, at the moment, but uh, uh, one of the interesting points on there is that uh, uh, some of the work we did at Sutton Bridge, where I, where I used to be, um, suggested that, for example, if we went to 4 degrees C for prepack rather than 2.5, which uh, uh, and that may mean that we've got to use a suppressant or a malic hydrazide treatment, then that could uh, make a significant saving in terms of running costs. Uh, and that's now being borne out by uh, commercial practice. I know people... Um, out in the industry are uh, making those sort of changes, coming up with uh, temperatures without any um, detriment on, uh, on uh, um, uh, blemish disease. And uh, this is some of the data from that work that was uh, done back in 2014 now. Um, so uh, um, that was looking at uh, uh, storage durations of up to six months with um, different temperatures, uh, some of which were required suppressants, but uh, largely those figures are, uh, with perhaps the exception of the five and a half degree uh, treatment, are instant, there's no significant difference between them. So uh, we can afford to go uh, to um, slightly warmer temperatures as long as we get all the other parts of the jigsaw right. And uh, in particular, I would emphasize condensation control. If we've got moisture around in any, any of these cold stores, uh, and then we don't uh, don't get that uh, um, moisture um, controlled, then uh, we we have an ideal situation for uh, uh, something like silver scurf to uh, uh, develop significantly. But it is possible to uh, successfully store um, prepack at four degrees or very close to it. Okay, um, a little bit about electrical metering data recording. Um, I went back through some old um, Sutton Bridge papers the other day, for some reason, don't really know why, but uh, I found something that said uh, 2004, um, and it was a uh, theme of electrical metering in storage. So we've been talking about this for nearly 20 years, and I still go to lots and lots of stores where I say, how much does it cost you to run your store? And people say, I don't know, I haven't got a meter on that store. So we need to change that. You know, I don't want to be too sort of bombastic about it, but you know, 20 years is a long time to do nothing. So let's, let's get our heads around this. And uh, you know, if, you, if you're running a potato store, you need to be able to uh, know how much it's costing you. Um, it's the most important variable cost. Um, Basically, if the store's not being used, it costs nothing, um, but don't treat it as an overhead because it is a really significant variable cost. Um, and uh, the energy experts and the people like NFU Energy who we're, we're working with on a, on a project at the moment um, tell us that 86% uh, of commercial buildings waste energy in the UK and potato stores would be well, well up on that list. Um, so I'll just flag up some of those things. I'm going to move on. Um, 
So there's some monitoring devices around that you can use these uh, things called current transformers to put around cables. They'll give you a signal, tell you how much energy is going down there. It'll read out on a submeter. Uh, you can get some fancy energy management systems um, that will give you a lot more information. And uh, um, they can link up these days to quite simple monitoring devices, um, things that will go in a 13 amp plug or just onto a, onto a DIN rail in a, in a uh, switch box, and they'll transmit back to uh, a, uh, an online system and produce lots of these types of graphics and dashboards, which will tell you everything that you need to know about that potato store in intimate detail. If you have the right equipment, you can get the feedback. So there are a number of different companies out there who are offering this type of uh, service, um, and you can start um, looking right down in drilling down into the detail to uh, identify where the, the efficient parts of your system are and where your inefficient parts are and then you can start uh, taking corrective action on a more general sense from uh, from a potato storage point of view um, we can do all of that work with the meters but if we've got some fundamentals not right with the building then we need to think about those so things like air leakage um, potato stores are controlled environments essentially we're trying to control the temperature possibly the humidity maybe the atmospherics in a uh, in a building but they only work really well if that if that atmosphere and that environment is, is truly controlled and if we've got external influences uh, that upsetting that uh, uh, control then that's where it costs us a lot of money um, so air leakage is, is, a, is a classic example of that. If, the, if it's a windy day, we're getting a lot of air passing through the store. Just because it's not airtight, then um, that is a, that's a problem. So you can do a simple light test in a store. Go in a store, turn out the lights. You can see where the leakage is to a large extent. Um, that we've had stores where we've had a total area, five square meters of leakage in a store. That's like having a very large door open um you know why would you want to do that um and it can be responsible for as much as uh, 50 percent of the of the energy cost in a store if, if we have got a really leaky store or, or we've got environmental conditions that um, accentuate that le leakage uh, this piece of work that we did at sutton bridge uh, back in oh now 10 years ago nearly 20 yeah, 10 years ago 2013 uh, showing air leakage in commercial stores and we've got a number of different um, uh, scales here um, these stores down here in this bottom corner they're the good stores okay 20 percent um, that were below uh, and this AP50 figure of, of three and then uh, we had another batch of stores in the middle here that were okay. They were inside what we'd call a, an upper limit for best practice. And then all of the ones in the circle, they were leaking far too much and costing a lot of money to run. Um, so um, these were actual tests done with a pressurization system that we uh, uh, put onto, um, onto a, a variety of uh, commercial stores across the country in that particular project. I don't think that story's changed very much at all, to be honest. I mean, I, I know it's 10 years old, but I, I haven't seen significant changes that would have uh, addressed that. Insulation, another big imp important component. Um, obviously, if we're trying to control an environment, we don't want external influence of other heat sources, um, things like uh, solar heat gain, is probably the biggest uh, factor, but also uh, thermal loss uh, due to it being a frosty night or whatever. Uh, we need insulation that is adequate to uh, uh, basically prevent us having to take those uh, corrective interventions inside the store. Um, and we can make adjustments to the uh, uh, thickness of the insulation uh, to try and buffer that uh, uh, as much as possible and we can get some significant paybacks on insulation upgrades, um, particularly if the insulation isn't, isn't that good in the first place, you will see a big gain, and then you'll get some level of diminishing return as you 
increase the, the insulation beyond that and, and then the pay, payback periods. We used to say payback periods on a lot of, a lot of insulation projects would probably be uh, five to seven years, but with the higher um, rates of uh, energy cost now, then uh, that means that that's, that's going to reduce and we're going to get payback more, more quickly. Making efficient use of air is another important uh, aspect. Um, and come back to the same thing, that intervention that we're making in the store, changing the temperature, whatever, we need to do that in an efficient way. So if we're pushing air around that store, uh, we need to be able to ensure that that uh, refrigerated air, for example, is going to actually cool the crop. If it's not gonna do that, then why are we, why are we uh, expending the energy? And we have too many overhead throw box stores in the potato industry. Uh, with what I call issues. Uh, they don't work e efficiently. Uh, short circuiting of air is a major problem, and I've talked about that for years um, and trying to deal with that. Um, a lot of the stores don't have uh, adequate distribution of the air, um, and so we just cannot get value out of the cooling system if we do that. Um, the air must do some work to be of benefit. So if we cool the air down, it has to go around the store, pick up heat and come back to the cooling coil with that heat. So at a higher temperature for the uh, crop temperature to be reduced. And if we don't do that e efficiently, then that's uh, um, not, um, not a good way to progress with our, with, with our potato storage. So um, things like these are the things I would go and look for in a store. Um, so this is a, a shot looking up to the roof. We've got a discharge of air coming from those chimneys and it's all hitting the, uh, uh, the ironwork in the roof, be that a beam or a um, purlin or whatever. Uh, the air isn't going anywhere. All of those marks on that roof tell me that that air is being turbulent at that point of discharge. So that means that that air is then, once, as soon as it's lost its velocity, it's not going to the other end of the shed. It's just gonna um, circulate and come straight back down into the front of the fridge. So that circulation is gonna carry on forever and cost money all the time. We've gotta get the air to the other end of the shed, pull it back through the potatoes, pick up the heat, and then we can do some good. And And, this is another example of that. So the air is just get, not getting past the beam on the right-hand side of the photograph. Just going to say a little bit about overhead throw stores further, and, and this is a, a project which we ran at Sutton Bridge um, probably about five or six years ago, uh, where we looked at the um, air coming back into uh, refrigeration units. Now, normally if I'd shown you an overhead throw store, uh, that unit in the middle of that store would have the coil uh, where that large sheet of silver um, metal is. Um, but what's happened in this store is that the uh, coil has been turned around and made to face the wall. Now, why is that insignificant? Well, um, you wouldn't think it was, and we, we actually didn't pick this up for many, many years, but actually if we take the air in through from the back uh, behind the unit, we get a much wider draw of air into that unit. And that's important from the point of view of the air distribution. And I can show you the data from that, uh, from that study, uh, which was done in conjunction with uh, Winters Lane storage uh, in Lincolnshire, uh, where we've just started a new spot um, storage project um, with GB potatoes. So here's some data from a standard coiled store. Um, and you can see quite an erratic flow of air. This was, uh, these were air speeds going into the store. But you can see quite a, at the front of the store where the fridge unit is, you can see most of the air is going into the middle in the green bit, this green bit here. And that's, what, that's not particularly efficient. Um, it's just air taking the shortest route. Whereas when we turned that fridge co coil around and made it face the wall, we were pulling from a much wider area and you can see the evenness of this uh, data across the whole store. So even at the back of the store, we got a much more even pattern because the air is being uh, pulled from 
um, a much wider area, so the air, and then the air will move to where the suction is. As you take air, you can't have a vacuum, so as you take the air away, then the air will move to it. So we got a much more uniform uh, distribution of air across that store. And so um, that is a, um, a simple change that was made to a, a store. And there are a number of uh, uh, growers in that locality, in the, in, in the sort of South Lincolnshire area where I'm based, um, who have now moved to this type of system. And everybody is very uh, supportive of that change. They are seeing the benefit. So um, that is something that uh, when we get the spot project uh, open day, we'll get around to that next May, um, you would be able to come and have a look at. Quick word on optimizing refrigeration. Um, Every store has got, a, uh, for prepack at least, has got a refrigeration unit in. Probably a lot of processing uh, systems have got a uh, refrigeration unit in as well. Um, wherever we've got refrigeration, again, we need to uh, make sure that the fridge is working to the best of its ability. Um, so if we don't get uh, air crop contact, if we've got that contact with, with the air in the store, then uh, we're not removing heat. So air distribution is the first point, and then the heat needs to transfer via those cooling coils in those big um, uh, coils um, to the refrigeration in the, in the evaporator, and then it's pumped through to the condensers to get the heat out of the store. So that goes through the, through the refrigeration system and comes out um, through a thing that looks a bit like this, or hopefully not too much like this, but essentially what we've got here is we've got, uh, we've got some coils outside which should be giving up heat. But these are examples that I've uh, seen in recent uh, months of uh, basically installations where we've got uh, something not working right. So in this case, we've got a missing fan. So the whole of this coil, we've only got two fans working. So this part of the coil is not doing anything. We, are, we can't get any heat away from that. So any heat that comes into this part of the coil will go back into the store. Here we can't get rid of the heat because we've got lots of boxes stacked around the, the um, condenser. And here we've just got a condenser coil that is full of dirt. So we haven't got any heat transfer to the air. So all of these factors all add up when we're trying to run a refrigeration system um, efficiently. These will count against us. These will put your, your running costs up. So it's all attention to detail, getting into the, to, to the nitty gritty of, of, of all of these different aspects to see how we can get better performance. Uh, finally, I just want to say a little bit about uh, automated control. Uh, it should be a given, but sadly it's not in most stores. We don't have people relying on automated control. I go to far too many farms where we've got an automated control available, but it's not being used properly. And so that is really quite frustrating because that immediately makes the system inefficient. If there's suitable air available, the system needs to be able to switch and um, bring that on. There are a lot of sophisticated controllers out there. Um, doesn't make it sophisticated or complicated to operate it just means it's got to be set up right and then it will do the job for you so make sure we've got the right temperatures uh, we've got the right variability uh, you know an acceptable level of variability um, and we, we know information about fan running times we can tell a lot from that, those sort of parameters and bottom line vent when there's a job to do not for the sake of it so don't just put recirculation fans on just because it makes you feel better just make sure it's doing something that's 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 useful and you'll build knowledge up over time if you've got a store of how to get the best out of it it won't happen instantly uh, there's a lot of capability out there as i've mentioned different systems around that can do a lot um, i'm not going to go into the detail of that but if you have got a system from one of these companies then i'm sure you can get their assistance to uh, um, make sure you get the best out of it. Last point I just make is renewables. Um, renewables now are quite an important part of the energy um, landscape and 
Uh, we are now in a situation with potato stores where some of the uh, systems can take account of what level of renewable energy is, is available. So if you've got solar, for example, or another source of renewable energy, then you, you can account for what um, energy is available in the way you control your store. And that will give you better value for money. Um, you need to be operating the system when there is free energy rather than having to buy it in from the grid and then sell it back because you can't use it when so so the controllers are much more sophisticated now and they can focus on that type of uh, availability i would recommend that you uh, uh, seek specialist advice for uh, tying in any renewable options on your particular uh, enterprise I'm going to stop there. I don't know if there's any quick questions anybody's got. No. Okay. Yes. It's almost an observation. So I'm, I, I'm, I do not run a big potato store. I'm not a big potato grower. But um, I spent a bit of time in a previous life uh, involved in sustainable building, like low energy house building. Um, if, if you're sort of someone who's building a very low energy house, a common thing you would do would be to use an infrared camera. To take, you take some snaps around the building with an infrared camera, uh, yeah. which you can hire, or you have to, probably some smartphones can do it even. I've got one on here. Yeah, there you go. And, and that very quickly shows you where hot or cold is. Absolutely. Water. Yeah. If, you know, if, that, if, if, I, if I was running a big potato store and spending thousands of pounds doing so, I might want to do that. Just look for. Well, look that, for that, that's certainly something that you can do. I mean, yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, that's something I spend my time doing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, right, I'll, I'm just conscious of time, so we just need to keep moving. So um, I'm just going to say a quick word about this uh, CIPC Residues Monitoring Group. So I'm, I'm slightly changing hats here from my uh, uh, private hat to, a, a, to a, a more public role I've been asked to do, which is to chair this uh, um, CIPC Residues Monitoring Group, and this is solely to meet uh, a, a requirement of uh, CRD on our industry. So CRD are the regulation division for uh, HSE uh, for, for chemicals. Um, we used CIPC as a, a sprout suppressant until uh, technically the 8th of January 2020, and um, then it was withdrawn. We still have that chemical in a lot of our potato stores because it's a very persistent chemical. Um, and therefore, there is a very low level of CIPC that is still getting into our potato crop. We knew that that was going to happen. CRD have now said that they want to monitor that through the imposition of a um, temporary maximum residue level of 0.35 mg per kilo. So that's coming in uh, from April next year. And any stores uh, that we've got um, where um, they were previously treated with CIPC, they would like to see data of, from potato residue, residue tests um, taken from those uh, stores if they've had potatoes in for more than two months. So uh, this group is setting up uh, to, to gather that data. What we need is your help to voluntarily uh, give us those uh, numbers from your regular um, residue screens so that we've got the data. Uh, we can submit it to CRD. We're confident that that will then tick their box and then we'll uh, be able to um, move on with this temporary MRL in, 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 in position. It's the same as has happened in Europe for the last two years, but uh, uh, we're just a little bit behind the curve. Uh, all the data will go in anonymously, as I mentioned. And so if you are able to help us, uh, if you can get in touch with me uh, or come and see me uh, after this uh, talk, then uh, we can take your details. And uh, if you're able to supply data or if you know somebody else who's able to supply data, that would be great. Because uh, without it, our industry won't um, meet the requirement and then we could have the problem of the uh, of the MRL being dropped to 0 0.01. If it goes down to 0 0.01, we won't be able to use any stores which were previously treated with CIPC. Okay. Thank you. Right. So uh, that's enough from me as the as the primary 
speaker. Um, I'm now going to ask um, Jeff, Richard and Gary if they'd like to come up uh, onto the panel. And we're going to run a, a Q&A on uh, sprout suppression. So we've got a lot of stores that are now running a, a completely different um, spectrum of sprout suppressants. Um, following the withdrawal of CIPC um, three, nearly four years ago. Um, and uh, different markets uh, are being, uh, using different, different products. So uh, Jeff is from McCain, um, Richard is from Lamb Western, and uh, Gary is from PepsiCo. So the, we're, we're talking about processing uh, stores here. And what I've done is I've asked these gents to just say a little bit about what, uh, products that they're, the primary products they're using um, why, and why, um, and then hopefully we can get a bit of a dialogue going with, the, with, with you guys in the audience on uh, how we can get the best out of these different products. Um, it's a completely different landscape than we had where we had sort of one size fits all with CIPC, very much not one size fits all anymore. So um, there is some information uh, there are some information voids, shall we say, in the industry at the moment, and we just need to be able to try and do a bit to, to fill those in. Okay. Did you do a... Uh, we, we haven't... Uh, we haven't drawn any straws. No. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm happy to kick off the Jeff, Jeff's volunteering to go first, so that's great. <laughs> well done. Yeah, so as I say, I'm, uh, I'm an agronomist with McCain Foods. Um, we first started looking at ethylene commercially in, uh, in 2016, so well before we lost CIPC. Um, the, the writing was on the wall, I guess, for CIPC, so we started looking at uh, ethylene as a, as a possible solution. Um, we, we, we allow the use of all the approved uh, products, so it's very much the grower's choice which they use. But uh, 2016, we did our first commercial store with ethylene, 1,500 tonnes in that year. And uh, we were uh, pleased with the result, results we got from that. We had a number of varieties in the store. We had a direct comparison, like for like, with CRPC. And we had very, very favorable results in that first year. So subsequent to that, we built, uh, built on that and did 10,000 tons with ethylene the following year in McCain stores. We also got a uh, couple of growers on board with us. And, um, you know, the rest is history, but uh, uh, probably we, we're looking at treating all the McCain stores, our own storage with ethylene, so that's uh, some 40,000 tonnes, and the majority of our growers um, have used ethylene um, since uh, CIPC was lost. I'll say we don't dictate what growers use, so some will be using the oils, mint and orange oil, and uh, some are now looking at DMN, now we've got the... Uh, registration for DMN. But in terms of um, you know, look, looking at cost, um, ethylene is, is by far the most cost effective product in my view, but it's not for every market. Um, I guess producing a chip rather than a crisp. And uh, we can go a little bit more leeway on fry color, um, but uh, I, I must say we haven't had any, any issues with, with, with fry color that we could relate to ethylene. In our, in our experience. So. Richard. Thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, so Richard Baines, uh, Rural Storage Manager at Lamb Western, um, look after um, allocation of crop throughout the year um, into our manufacturing facility in Wisbeach. Um, since 2020, we've predominantly gone down the oils route for short, medium and long-term storage, um, but now as we move into since 2022, uh, we're actually using all products available on the market. Um, predominantly, that would be around the oils and, and DMN at this present state and time. Um, certainly from an, from an oils point of view, um, we learnt very quickly with the loss of CIPC, firstly with Bioxem, mint oil, and then subsequently with Argos, the orange oil as well. And so far we've got on very well with them. We know where their limitations are in terms of ensuring stores are dry, uh, there's no levels of condensation within them, um, and also learning the level of sprout aggression you can deal with depending on which product it is. Um, and adjusting rates at times as well, um, and variety difference in terms of aggressiveness of sprouts as well. 
So yeah, we, we use all, all products at the moment, um, but we're currently leaning down the, the DMN and oils route at this stage. Oh, hello everyone, I'm Gary Collins, the technical manager at PepsiCo. I'll start by saying what we don't use. Uh, we don't use ethylene. Uh, Jeff mentioned this earlier, the, the process of frying is a lot harsher to make a crisp over a chip. Uh, and we find that the sugar levels that we find in crisps are unacceptable and give us an unacceptable product when we use ethylene. So we've steered clear of ethylene. So yeah, we started using in 2020, we had no choice. We had to use mint, so we were using mint first year, second year mint and orange, and then last year uh, mint, orange, and, uh, and DMM. So we've used all three. And I think the strategy for all of these is very different. We're still learning, of course. We've had one year with all three, and there's a lot to learn. So, you know, it's a combination of the store quality, as Adrian's been talking about, and the capability of the store, the crop, the crop season, and um, the, the variety, which is playing a key part. And we're seeing some big differences on variety response to, especially the oils, because we're waiting for a, a sprout before we kill it, which is kind of counterintuitive to what we've had with the CIPC in the past. Of course, we try and keep a crop dormant, uh, and so we wait for sprouts to develop, and then we kill them. And we're seeing differences in the response to sprouting. Um, and I think uh, when we look at things like MH, so some very different years, and that's having a big impact on, on what we're seeing. So last year was challenging with low levels of MH, uh, levels typically half the level for crop 22 that we saw at crop 20. So we were very lucky in the first year of mint and no uh, CIPC, and that we had good MH and therefore good extended dormancy from the MH. So very different seasons. Again, it's going to take us a few years yet before we can say from the season we see, the crop we see, the variety, the store capabilities, I know what my program will be. And the other thing that's overlaid this year, which is kind of a bit of a curveball from when I looked at what we could do for this year with our variety mix and the season, is the fact of uh, breakdown in store and free water in the store when we want to use sprouts presents and that's challenging but um yeah so we're using those the, the three products but uh, we're, we're not using ethylene okay thank you um i've got a question for you um so are, are you all from a strategic perspective are you all using malic hydrozide as a pre-treatment to, to, to all of the, these products yes yeah. yes yeah, yeah. yeah. Where, where where it can be applied effectively yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so I think that's something that we have <coughs> seen as a major change in, in, in strategy um, since the IPC went, is that we've had to move to something that gives us a residual control between doses. Um, for a lot of these uh, new products, we need to have something that sort of gives us a background level of control. Um, and that's uh, coming from the lake hydrozide application in the field. So uh, um, that's been a, a significant change. So uh, has anybody got any particular questions on, on James. The obvious one is the weight loss comparison between products, basically. Growth is all about selling yield. Can everybody hear at the back or not? not can, oh, the, the, can, the, James, can we get you to use the, well, the microphone? Sorry. The, the, the question was about weight loss. And yeah, weight the, loss the key comparison. for growers is understanding weight loss comparison between products, basically. <clears throat> be interested to hear what your views are. Um, there's a lot of anecdotal talk of, of, of weight loss. Um, there's some very good work done at Sutton Bridge, which Adrian will be f uh, very familiar with that show that the differences between treatments was, there was some differences, but they, they weren't uh, huge. Um, I guess the question that growers have to ask is, is does the weight loss cover the cost? Um, you know, with ethylene, you will usually or often see a, a short sprout that stays short and brittle and break off. Um, but, it, you know, the, in our earlier work with that, with uh, comparing it with CIPC, we're finding perhaps half to one percent additional weight loss compared to the CIPC. Now, DMN is another treatment. We we, we know it's very effective at, at, at managing sprouts, so you know there might be the slightly bigger differences. And anecdotally, you know, we do hear of, of, of you know bigger differences. But has anybody got actually is that who is actually measuring weight loss in their own stores? 
there's not many stores that are weighed in and weighed out, uh, which we do as Alan McCain stores. Um, how many of you are putting weight loss samples in the stores and measuring it? So, you know, I'd encourage you all to do that to get some some actual data rather than any anecdotal. Your your thoughts on it, Jamie? Uh, no, I think, I think it's a valid point. Who's doing this work? It's been lacking that mm. in the industry, definitely. Yeah. Um, hopefully, Spot Farm Storage will be looking at this. Who's paying for Spot Star Farm Storage? I'm not sure. Well, I'm not sure at the moment either, no, no, James, no. to be honest. <laughs> as a, as a, <laughs> We're trying to move forward with a, it. As a yeah. GB uh, potato member, mm. no doubt yeah. welcome to contribute to it. The key is to get the rest of the industry behind it. Absolutely. That's a bit of, of a plug for GB, basically. But no, look, we, we, we've seen more weight loss through ethylene within our own business, basically. But uh, we've had, we've had uh, good sprout control across all the products. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's an education. Yeah. I think that's a good point because we're going to get weight loss in every store, but if you say what's the minimum you could achieve based on you know, looking at sprout control, have we got it right in every store over the last three years? No. no. So year one, we're all learning with Mint. So the whole country was doing a huge Mint trial in year one. I know everyone's been looking and doing their own things in, in the odd store, but kind of across the whole country, a uh, huge amount of learning going on. And we got it wrong because we go on too early, we waste the product. We go on too late, we've got an issue with weight loss and sprout control. So it's trying to hit that sweet spot and we don't know what we're doing. And the varieties change and we leave it a week and then we're out of control. It's very easy to look back and say we should have gone earlier or we should have waited. And I think that's part of the experience of learning. So I think the, the whole question around weight loss is a really interesting one mm -hmm. because apart from, you know, even if you set it up as a commercial, as a trial in what was Sutton Bridge, when do you go? And you've got mixed varieties, and that's another complication. Or even the same variety from different fields with no MH on one and 25 parts per million on another. And you think, well, it's all complication, and I think we're still learning. But the, you see a sprout and you kill it, you know that water's gone, and it's gone from the tube, and that's weight loss and dehydrate, you know, it's um, loss of turgidity. So it's not what we're after. But it's a good question because I think we're a long way from having a, an answer on what the minimum could be in any store in any season. I'd, I'd echo most of Gary's, well, all of Gary's comments, but we, we talked anecdotally, certainly anecdotally, um, through mode of, the, both theoretically and from what I've seen from personal experience, uh, through mode of action, uh, which has been discussed in terms of waiting for a sprout to grow and killing it. Um, Anecdotally, uh, we do see that DMN treated stores feel firmer, um, and so anecdotally, it does. I, I feel like we're seeing less weight loss in there, but we haven't done the detailed trials to uh, show that data. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm sure we we will. Um, you know, we are as McCain. We're looking at all all the alternatives that are available. Um, it's very difficult getting a true like for like comparison, isn't it? Yep. In, you know, in, commercial, in commercial stores, you know, we try our best. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, from what I've seen of DMN, both at Southern Bridge Trials and, and now commercially, yes, it will be less weight loss. I think you do get very firm tubers generally. I've seen, I've seen instances where we haven't had spout control with DMN. You know, and equally, I've seen very good control with ethylene. And it's, it's it's just knowing what's uh, what you know what's causing it really. Uh, but I, I, again, I come back to that that cost element. It's okay. Any any more questions? Just conscious with uh, Simon. Do you want to? Yeah, only we are doing a weight loss trial. Of, uh, some description of the spot on the store trial. And we've got these pods. Probably going to need to get you to, to use the, the mic, if you don't mind. Sorry. So we've got these pods that are from the University of Greenwich, which are sponsored by CHAP. Um, the processing one has been a little bit temperamental, so we're not sure how good the data is going to be. But certainly the one in the prepack store might be more uh, information, give you more information. The yep. only other thing I've got is nets in the store from the PCN trials, from the a uh, whole beach demonstration site in the summer, which were all weighed into store, so we will get weights out of store of those bags. But again, they are different varieties. But it'll give us an indication. Okay, thank you. Um, in case you wonder what we're talking about, 
on the front of the potato review is a picture of one of the University of Greenwich pods. Um, so if you've got a copy of the potato review from the, uh, from the show guide, then uh, there, there's a picture there. Um, it's a device for measuring respiration and, uh, and weight loss. Um, okay. I think we're at a point where I'm just going to uh, wrap up. And Can I so just make one comment on, yeah, sure. on, on MH? I think it's, it's probably now our cheapest sprout suppressant. So we talked about using it. And we've repeated the work that Sutton Bridge did looking at levels of MH and sprout control. And um, we've seen very good sprout control or re reduction in sprout length at five parts per million or four parts per million. So I think if it's less than ideal conditions in the field, we've still encouraged people to use it. Because if you drop down from probably a 15, 20 down to a five, it still has a, a benefit in store. So it's worth, still worth considering. Yeah, I think that's a valuable point to, to, to make. Uh, because we need all, all, all the different armory that, we can, that we've got available, basically, to, uh, to, to crack the problem.